of all of the things that the media is talking about right now, there's one story that isn't getting the attention it deserves. Now, we talked a lot about the LAC with China and what's happening in Ladakh, but somehow it's slipped away from our public consciousness. Incidentally, the things at the border have not simmered at all. And there are a lot of mixed messages coming in on whether or not diplomatically or otherwise we've managed to find a solution. I have with me Ajay Shukla, retired colonel of the Indian Army and a prolific journalist when it comes to matters of defense. He's a very respected voice, so I'm extremely glad that he's agreed to join us right now. Uh, Ajay, thank you so much for giving us time and uh, answering our, agreeing to answer our questions. To just bring you first to what's being, to what's being reported right now, the Indian Express says that talks between India-China diplomats on Thursday could not achieve a breakthrough. But on the other hand, the Ministry of External Affairs says that there's been candid and in-depth exchange of views and a reaffirmed uh, accordance with agreements have been reached between the two finance ministries. How do we understand or how do we interpret what's going on? Is this... Is, is, is disengagement happening or is it not happening? Well, uh, Faye, it depends on whether you want to listen to the statement or you want to go by the action that's being taken on the ground. Now, mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese are very good at this diplomatic back and forth. They will say, we will withdraw from all uh, sort of Indian uh, territory and we will revert stay on our side of the line of actual control. Uh, but having made that statement, the interpretation that they will give it is that they will interpret it according to what they at this particular moment in time regard as the line of actual control and what they regard as Indian territory and what they regard as Chinese territory. So while they may remain from the Indian perspective, uh, ensconced on Indian territory on a line of control that never existed up till this point in time. Uh, from the Chinese perspective, they, they will say that we are going by what we have committed diplomatically. We are on our side of the line of control. It's just that their interpretation of their side of the line of control is completely different from the Indian interpretation. So this diplomatic back and forth and commitment given has to match with what is happening on the ground and the actual movements and withdrawals and so on. And that is where the dichotomy lies. Yes. Uh, the Indian government, which is seeking to downplay this whole thing, is going by the diplomatic statements. But journalists like me and the military, for that matter, uh, are more preoccupied with what the Chinese are actually doing on the ground. And that is not satisfactory at all. So what, is, what are the Chinese doing on the ground? Ask. Well, effectively, they have uh, moved the line of actual control forward into Indian territory uh, by about uh, 15 to 18 kilometers in the Tepsang area, by about one kilometer in Galwan, by about two to three kilometers in Hot Spring, and by about eight kilometers in, uh, in uh, the Pangong sector. Now, it's one thing to look at it in terms of these very mundane figures, two kilometers, three kilometers. One would get up and say, oh, why is it such a big deal conceding one kilometer in a, in a sort of thousand kilometer boundary? But when you actually join these lines and arrive at a new line of actual control, you suddenly find that these one and two kilometers have become several hundred kilometers because uh, the, the, the area in between these ingress points also effectively comes under Chinese control. So that's the, 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 where the problem lies. What seems to be small ingresses when you look at it only at one point, for example, Pangong, actually translates into a much larger ingress when seen across the entire length of the line of actual control. So what you're saying effectively is that India has lost territory to China. Is that it is, is there any way to get that back? Or is this a given right now, um, you know, in the last couple of months? Uh, it is, it's a given. Uh, the territory as of now is lost. Uh, if we want it back, I suspect uh, we will have to resort to armed action or we'll, we'll have to resort to occupying Chinese territory in another sector where they are less well poised and less ready. But at this point in time, you know, the Chinese took advantage of an Indian sort of 
shortfall of readiness, partly due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and they just came and occupied that territory. And by the time the Indians reacted and confronted the Chinese, the Chinese were already in occupation of a certain amount of Indian territory. Now the choice at that stage was whether we're going to start launching a fight immediately or we are going to try and negotiate this diplomatically. And New Delhi decided to try and negotiate it diplomatically, which was, I, I have to say is the sensible thing to do. But having seen that the Chinese have no give at all, they are not withdrawing beyond a point, uh, the hard choices then come onto the table. What are you going to do? Are you going to accept this or are you going to resort to other methods to try and get back mm -hmm. our lost territory? There's been a fair amount of diplomatic mouse as well in the fact that China recently, about a week ago, said that India should conduct uh, an inquiry into uh, who on the Indian side was responsible for the incursion from the Indian side. And then India responded saying there is no such inquiry. So China's sort of digging its boots into the fact that it doesn't believe it's in the wrong at all. And it was, in fact, the Indian troops who crossed over to their side. Um, how do we interpret this sort of conversation? Is China sending a message to the international community saying that it's not backing down? Is this China's new form of diplomacy where it talks stuff with all okay, This is not a new form of diplomacy at all when it comes to China's. This is standard China game plan. Uh, this is how they functioned all across the South China Sea. This is how they functioned with the Russians on their border when it had not been resolved. Uh, this is how the Chinese have functioned for several thousand years now. Uh, they uh, sort of give a certain interpretation of where the boundary lies, of what territory is Chinese and what territory is belong. And that's a shifting interpretation. When it suits them, they will choose one interpretation. When they're at a disadvantage, they will backtrack from that. This is all considered part of the give and take, the hurly-burly of international geopolitics as far as China is concerned. So China is, is sort of making the simple point at this uh, stage that we are in our territory, and any Indian attempts to try and reclaim that would amount to India trying to get into Chinese territory. So it's just a question of how you perceive it. It's, it's like those children's games that you play. Uh, and, you know, having drawn a line in the sand uh, and sort of staked one's claim to that line in, in the sand, uh, it becomes incumbent on the other side to try and reclaim it. And right now, the onus is on India to reclaim its territory. China is simply saying, this is ours, and that's the way it is. If I may, I just want to put uh, one of your uh, tweets on the screen, and you would uh, actually written about this extensively as well, about a statement posted on the website of the Ministry of Defense, uh, a screenshot of which you attached to your tweet, uh, which belatedly, according to you, admitted that the that Chinese troops had in fact transgressed the line of control um, in May in several sectors, uh, something that the government had then proceeded to deny. And this particular uh, you know, document was taken down, we understand, from the Defense Ministry's uh, website. There's been, again, like you've pointed out, a lack of accountability and not really any sort of clear message from the government on whether there was a transgression or not. Uh, do you see this? First question, as you know, um, as some sort of bundling of this whole thing uh, from, uh, you know, from inside the government, that between the Ministry of Defense and the Prime Minister's office and the NSA, there seems to be some miscommunication. Uh, well, miscommunication is a very polite way of, uh, of phrasing it. Uh, I think what has happened from the start is that the government has decided to take the stance <laughs> that the Chinese have not ingressed into Indian territory. Uh, they, they felt that this perhaps, I'm, I'm speculating here, they felt perhaps that they would be able to resolve this issue, that China transgresses every year in some sector or the other, and most of the time they just withdraw after a period of time, having made a point, having a stake to claim, and the government perhaps felt that this year would be the same. But this year was not the same. This year was very different. China came with much larger numbers on a much broader frontage with much more violent intent. 
uh, and it was clear to all that this was this was a different ball game this year but the government decided to take the stance that no nothing was nothing had happened uh, and then that started running into uh, sort of uh, situations where it was no longer possible to deny what they were saying uh, or to deny the fact that the chinese were in possession of indian territory and the first such thing was the killing of 20 indian soldiers on june the 15th now uh, astonishingly you know while rajnath singh uh, i have to grant him some credit in this matter was trying to say that you know the chinese are have come in larger numbers than before they are across the border and so on uh, the rest of the government especially the prime minister's office and the national security council was just not willing to make this admission <clears throat> and so the chain the the prime minister was asked to make the statement at that all party meeting that na koi ghusa hai na koi ghusa hua hai uh, and it's a statement that was patently false and it was proven false on multiple occasions most of all by the defense ministry's own document that admitted to transgressions in three areas galwan hot springs and pangong now when i tweeted and other people took notice of that as well uh they quickly took down the message but the the issue is uh, are we going to continue trying to deny that anything is wrong while at the same time trying to discuss uh this uh, engagement and withdrawal and creation of buffer zones there's there are so many contradictions in between what the government is doing and what the government is saying that uh, it's very hard to miss in the government by not bringing the opposition on board by not admitting clearly to to india and to indians that you know there's a situation that we are going to have to deal with we are all from the same country everybody i'm sure would back the government in a situation like this but the government is choosing to to adopt a policy of denial instead and that's when it runs up against these contradictions you also um, and, and you also talked about the intelligence failure you said that the government given all of its equipment and satellite and we've had since then many amateurs uh, you know pulling up satellite images and pointing things out on television channels but given the intelligence and the ability available to government you say in one of your articles that the government should have known by the 5th of may that china had moved in its troops they should have been a stronger action that was on our side of the border as well do you see this as an intelligence failure was it a again a communication failure or did we just make bad decisions uh we just made bad decisions uh the intelligence was there uh, not on the 5th of may but on the 19th of april uh mm. that was the stage at which intelligence agencies began sounding the warning uh there were written communications sent to the army in uh, in uh, jammu and kashmir uh, there was there was sort of warning sounded even before 5th 19th of april that you know given our actions in kashmir on the 5th of august last year the chinese were looking for a chance to to settle scores uh so the you know uh, pay as you would appreciate there are many different agencies in government and one agency having found one piece of information and i'm referring to the civilian intelligence agencies in in this particular case they can only bring it to the notice of the you know joint intelligence committee or the the various bodies that sit and mull over these situations and if the decision taken during that meeting is that this intelligence is uh, is sort of uh, not worth taking action on or not worth reacting to in a very major way then that intelligence has no meaning really it's it's a it's a failure of interpretation and analysis mm. and decision making that is what was the case this time india knew china was exercising across the border they knew that they had had a big build up of pla troops uh, in opposite demchok and pangong but what the pla's intention was was misread they thought that this was just a routine thing that was done every year and this year as usual the pla were to go back after doing their exercises except that the pla had other intentions but um if i may ask again as a lay person now that we have a national security advisor mr dobel and we have unlike previous instances we have a cds a chief of defense staff mr rawat uh 
the expectation would have been of clearer communication between these two offices and the prime minister's office and the defense minister's office so that you know this sort of falling through the tracks doesn't happen did the system not work uh, the system partly worked in that the intelligence was available but it also partly did not work in that the intelligence was misread now remember all of these things come together under the national security council if they have a meeting of the joint intelligence committee or another committee you have different wings of the government telling you different things and that's par for the course that's how it works in every intelligence meeting across the world you have some people saying was well, something and some people saying another but when you have somebody like mr ajit dobal sitting on top uh, who's known as india's mr james bond and who has a sterling record of actually handling intelligence one would expect better decision making and better interpretation and that's where the failure lied so i think that there was there were successes there were failures but for me the big failure has been the way that the government handled it the denials the obfuscations the unwillingness to bring a, uh, you know the opposition on board to cast uh, slurs on anyone who was pointing out that the chinese had actually ingressed to sort of vilify them as anti national these are the real failures of this particular episode do you believe and and there has been a sort of uh, you know uh, a dog whistling and trumpet calls of nationalism stand with the army this sort of thing which we've done over the last few years as well is this a situation you believe china took advantage of Oh yes, China has uh, read. Uh, Xi Jinping has read Prime Minister Modi brilliantly. He's figured out that you can push on the border to a great extent, but the Indian government will not be in a position to accept that and to publicly uh, sort of accept that, for the simple reason that there's a whole muscular nationalistic image that has to be maintained over here. so china has seen that window of opportunity and this is a classic example of how they have operated inside the minds of the indian decision makers also the banning of apps including tiktok and a couple of and, and the other apps that were banned another list was released do you think this has made any difference at all to china well not in substantive terms as we can see they've not gone back from uh, many of the positions that they've occupied uh the like i said you know it's action on the ground it's the talk that is walked uh, that actually matters and in that you know this you know banning of a few apps or a sort of casting temporary restrictions on foreign direct investment by chinese companies uh, these have limited value i think we are playing hard global power politics over here uh, and you know the the this is a border that is hotly contested this is a border which the two countries have been to war over this is a border which has had numerous incidences over the last uh, decade uh, certainly since 2013 so you know on all the issues that really matter i think china has demonstrated a acute lack of give well uh, is it true also that there are now 35000 troops uh, on the indian side in ladakh hunkering down for a long very cold winter uh, who remain eyeball to eyeball with china well that seems to be the the position as of now uh, but remember you know whenever you think that the situation is very bad you got to remember there are two sides to the game over here there are two sets of players and if things are bad for the 35000 indian soldiers who are hunkered down in the cold and the mist and the rain and the high altitude so too is it for the chinese as well uh, and the indian army has a sterling record of being able to sustain itself on these borders for a very long durations of time you will recall that when the kargil intrusions took place the uh, india then occupied the kargil border and occupied heights that were at 18000 19000 feet even higher than uh, the siachen glacier so the indian army's uh, ability to deal with these such situations is in my opinion significantly higher than the chinese army so i'm uh, while the situation looks grim right now it looks like we might have to hunker down from winter for the whole of winter Uh, i don't think uh, the die has been cast that surely as yet 
we could yet see some uh, sort of uh, withdrawal from the Chinese side or at least a certain mm -hmm. amount of give when they realize that they're also facing a nasty situation. And, and there have been reports saying that India, the Indian troops are, are better acclimatized to that altitude than the Chinese troops are. Is that, is that a fair assessment? No, no, that's not a fair assessment. The Chinese troops were all based in Tibet. They're in Xinjiang. They were all based at altitudes of 13, 14,000 feet. They are very well acclimatized, as well acclimatized as we are. Okay. Um, and last question, Ajay. What do you what do you think is likely to happen now? Um, is it like are we are we going to continue to have these three things happen simultaneously, which is diplomatic attempts on one side, the NSA making phone calls, uh, you know, uh, military conversations happening on the ground, and then a fully alert army on the on the border? Is this likely to continue through the winter? And where is the breakthrough, if at all, going to come from? Well, the, the, that's a, that's a million-dollar question. I wish I had the answer to that. Uh, right now, one has to just play it as it comes, you know, uh, yes. based on what actions are taken from both sides, how one reacts to the other. Uh, it's very hard to make an assessment as yet. Will China believe that they have achieved their aims uh, and it is now time to withdraw? Will they believe that they have sent across the message that they wanted to send? Uh, or on the other hand, looking at it from the Indian perspective, uh, will the Indian side believe that taking action only through diplomatic calls and not resorting to force on the ground or uh, sort of a, a sort of a reoccupation re of your own territory by the use of armed force, uh, is that the way to go for, for handling this situation? Uh, there are decisions to be made on both sides and the ultimate play out of how this happens uh, and whether we're going to spend the rest of the winter there uh, is going to depend on a lot of these decisions and how they are played out. So I would say the ball is very much up in the air. Uh, we are still going to see, it's only uh, August as yet. Uh, September is still uh, a bearable month. It's only towards the end of October that things start getting really cold and chilly over there. So I think that we're, we, we, we should not rush to judgment over here. Let's wait and see how this plays out. Excellent. Um, Ajay Shukla, thank you so much for giving us time and answering our questions. I do hope we can continue having these conversations um, as you are obviously not hunkering down because you're in Kunur, which is a lovely place to be locked down in. And uh, I'm sure our audience... Uh, I'm one of the fortunate Indians who are not sitting in the dark at this point in time. But thanks for the, for the talk. It was fun talking to you. It was lovely talking to you too and uh, thank you for answering our questions. I'm sure our audience benefited greatly uh, from understanding this topic a little better. Ajay Shukla, Karnal Ajay Shukla, they're answering questions on India and China and what's likely to happen next.